Hey everyone, I'm Tassinix, and welcome to Plotting and Scheming, covering Season 58, 3 vs. 3 Grand Arena Championship, Week 3 for Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes. I am joined by my regular co-hosts, Dagger, TJ, Sasha Aisha, and Fatal. Guys, it was a good week on a really successful season. I actually went 7-2. and two. I, I lost the very last round of the season, which, uh, you know, it's a bitter, bitter note, but... I lost to my guildmate, uh, who had a real casual 15 plus million GP and over 1,400 Datacron rerolls. Uh, every Cron on defense was like 380 plus percent defense. It was a wild experience, but uh, nonetheless, a good week. Dagger, how about you? I just want to be clear. Is this the take that we're going to keep? Yes. Or are we restarting again? No. So far, okay. so good. Okay. <laughs> I can always edit you out later. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, we'll, we'll fix it in post. We'll fix it in post. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> no, it was. It There's was a post. Be... <laughs> shut, <laughs> shut up. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the pre. The the <laughs> upload the upload button is the post production. Okay. Ah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I I'm sorry. I missed last week. It, I listened to the show. It was good stuff, guys. Uh, but yeah, I went I went three and zero. Um, man, this this week was brutal for my opponents because I've. <laughs> I went one and two, one and two, so that means for the last week I was, I don't want to be mean to people I played, but yeah, it was my last round of, my, my ninth round, like, the guy didn't have great months. Like, mm -hmm. that's where I was in GAC, just so you guys know. <laughs> All right, fair spot so, to be. yeah, this last week was, I don't want to say easy, because that, that sounds disrespectful, but no, I I don't think anybody cleared my front wall this last so, week. So oh, it was geez. hard? Okay. Yeah, I mean, like, I just placed the DTM, the, the or sorry, I just placed the Great Mother's team, and I don't think it was cleared all week. Fair. Very fair. Um, you know, before we move on from you, uh, you also had some news to share with the people. I'm not, I'm not going to share that news on, I'm not going to share that news publicly. Oh, and I thought that was the point. And, okay. No, that was, that was not, that was a housekeeping item and, and not. Yeah, that, so. that was, that was a housekeeping item regarding how many... How much I'm going to have to say on the meta reports going forward? Mm -hmm. That yes. was not something I wanted to announce. But but definitely in a game where Wait, we soon. can just edit that out of post. soon in the near future. There. Yeah yeah yeah. De definitely do do not add that in. But of course, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good call. That's Very good. good. Call. Uh, well, TJ, how about you? How'd your week go? Actually, three and zero. So I think I'm with Ooh. you, seven and Ooh. two. Uh, and I got to give props, man. And we'll talk about it. But my last round. The dude uh, reigns, so he's in the top and done it. Man, he absolutely just crushed my defense. And, and props to him, dude. He was pulling up numbers. I was looking to, like, uh, biting my nails, but ended up getting the win because of ships. Because, as you know, we all love ships. And I, I begrudgingly put it out that way. I'll take my dub, but, you know, it's not. It's not without its point. So, 3-0. Mm -hmm. no. right. Fair enough. Sasha, Aisha, sir, how was your week up there in uh, Fighting Erodium's land? Yeah, you know, I actually got uh I had I had multiple great matches. Uh I got uh I had Aesop and Partick. I ended up going two and one in the week. Uh I had a great match with Aesop. I won that one and then uh a fun match with Partick as well that uh did not go my way. I, I didn't realize until too late that it was a little bit of an efficiency match, but uh it was good strategy and execution on uh Bay Bay's part in that in that match. Like he just really played well. So uh but really yeah, fun matches. So uh a a good week. Awesome. Glad to hear that. And Fatal, how about you? How did the week or how did the season end up? I know it's been kind of just a muted season for you, but how was this last week? I mean, yeah, just kind of ended up down in the doldrums, and uh, I think the season probably ended up as like a six and three. But like, given the circumstances, it easily should have been eight and one, and like, very arguably should have been a nine and zero. Oh. Like, the the eight and one is literally like to be clear. One match is like, hey, if you show up and do five fights, you win for free, and the other fight was lost yeah. because of a technical difficulty. So like. G genuinely two free wins got lost put me down to 6-3 but yeah no mostly it's just like all right I, I was down to like rank 600 or some shit it's like all right this doesn't sit right with me the match it like barely anybody cleared more than his own this season it's like all right let's enough is enough like let me sit down spend some time with the game and like get things moving in a decent direction 
Yeah, it's a fine line. I spent this. I spent this season in like the two, like between like one fifty and three hundred. It it it's a fine line, man. Running out of time to play the game, but also like wanting to actually have the competition when you do play. Mm-hmm. I just far prefer the competition. Like I, I, yeah. honestly, if there's no comp- competition, there, it feels like there's little reason to show up sometimes. And just like I don't want to do this. You don't want to do this. Like <laughs> I mean, yeah. you know, I can no, still make some interesting fights out of it, but it's just like. I, I don't want to ever have to feel like apologetic over like doing some grand arena, right? It's like, yeah. I my preference with the game is I always want to be the underdog. The, the moment that I'm the favorite, it just feels kind of gross. I'm like, yeah, not really a good vibe. All right, well, fair enough. But I know I know at the end of the last week you were saying that you were gearing up to make a sustained climb, so. You're gonna just tear through this next season, I imagine. Let's let's see the eight one nine zero for that, yeah. Well, ironically, usually I would say three v three is the season where I just absolutely tear through. Uh, but given that I managed to lose three matches that I probably shouldn't have lost, now I'm in a position that I kind of need to do it in five v five. And so here's hoping that it's just not a cheesy season because the... yeah, the, the the skill gap in fives is. Narrower than the skill gap in threes. Three v three has historically just been like the print free wins season. That like, I don't know if, if this ends up just being a hyper efficiency season. Then I cannot promise which way it'll go. Maybe, maybe I will just say fuck it. We're playing efficiency, or I might end up doing dumb shit again. But basically, the dynamic right now is I need to capitalize on three v three season because that's when the galaxy is good. That you know, whatever happens in five u five, it's within the budget. Fair enough. All right. Well, guys, uh, let's dig into the meta analysis for this week. So you know, probably not a ton of new matchups, but the first one I wanted to talk about was Great Mothers Morgan and then DTP. Uh, we were all talking about how Slacker, uh, you know, using the crew Slacker Hux counter. It can be impeded by DTP getting to have a turnoff when Slacker is not in his ultimate. So, you know, he'll have lowered his health a ton by being in that turn meter loop and he can get himself one shot. I did fight this a couple times with Slacker and found that it was still workable. Uh, I had to manage a couple turns carefully, but otherwise it seemed pretty well in hand. Uh, Did you guys have any, you know, contrary experience or any notes on that? I got it to work without the 15% level 3. You got I, broken up by what? I got it to work without using the 15% level oh, 3. Oh, the turn meter level 3. Okay, so yeah, what did you use? Thing. Speed up? The speed up? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, no, I, I think I just had a break. I just had a break on level oh, 3. Oh, okay. And I still got it to work. The, the, the thing without Night Sister Spirit is that the team actually lacks overall damage, even though DTP's AoE, like, hurts. Don't get me wrong. Like, it tickled. Like, it... If you don't have negative hit HP, like, from the level 3, like, Spirit does so much more damage than DTP, it's hilarious. Also, Fair. Great Mothers getting the Blessed every time is really... I'm sorry, uh, Morgan getting the Blessed is, like, okay. Yeah, I mean, it is nice that she can't be stunned, but for all that it seemed to matter, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's all I mean, is, like, I... I, I I think it's still harder. Like, I, I would imagine the win percentage is not like the eighty-five percent that it was, or whatever it was with the like, with the fifteen percent, right? Because that win percentage was way higher, right? Um, but I still think it'll work. Um, I ended up killing great mothers, and worst case, I think you just lose the one v one to Morgan. Okay, it sounds mm-hmm. awful to say, but you might just lose one v one to Morgan. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah. I don't know if anybody else has thoughts on that. No, I I tried it. Uh, I I used uh, that that crew slacker uh, approach against uh, that the great mothers DTP 
both times this week. And I think I, one of them was with a TM level three, the other with speed up. Uh, I was kind of curious to see the difference. And to me, it felt like it really came down to just sort of really monitoring turn meter and making sure that uh, a grenade doesn't come off uh, from DTP without your slacker being an alt. Um, yeah. And yeah, so it, it, it worked pretty smoothly. Honestly, it might be easy enough just to hold your alt like two turns just to allow him to get close on turn meter and then three turn alt to make sure that he doesn't that he throws his bomb while you're in alt. Yeah, I got a little yeah. scared because I had just over sl slightly over one ultimate charge uh, in both of my battles when DTP looked like he had hazardous, you know, hazardously high turn meter. And so I, you know, ripped it and managed to just keep a loop going after I would go out of ultimate after only one swipe or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but that was only using the turn meter crumb. I will say that. I didn't take any chances at all. Uh, and still, things just barely worked. Was, I do was... want to make a speed up on basic attacker, Kron. Mm. I need to reroll a level three. For what case? Uh, just general use case. I found out that after talking to like a couple people that I don't have one. <laughs> mm, yeah oh yeah i definitely have a couple yeah they are nice all right um if that if nobody else had any notes on that one uh next was just going to be talking about splits of saw and luthan you know for weeks one and two i pretty much saw uh, i saw saw and luthan together uh only here a couple times in week three did i see something like saw Krex, kyle on one team and then you know hidden in the back tucked away would be mon mothman uh, Mom, Mothma, Luthan, and Pow. Uh, and I, I will say, you know, that is not something that you actually want to run up against with Aiden. I thought it would be, and it turns out it was not. So, any experience fighting these splits, gentlemen? Uh, I'm going to give you one more. Thanks to Fatal. Um, I did his cheeky one of trying to do the all the supports, and it actually did get a hold round two, and that was the saw with Krex and um, Luthen on the same team, adding the support in there, and it did get a hold for me. Uh, when I faced the um, saw, Luthen still feels solved with JML. Like I even provided the you know the team with the video of uh, what I was able to do with it. Uh, but when you go into the Mon Mothma, I think that changes the game. Uh, I came up against it, but I, I didn't underestimate it. Saw Krex, or uh, MM Krex, super easy with Aizen. Uh, with Aizen, the minute you put in the, the Luthen, nope, I took Inquisitors. I was not playing with that team because I knew what they were going to try to do if I let it go. So that, yeah, nope. No, well, sir. It turned, well, yeah, and I Aizen the Mon Mothma. Like, you, you, you open on POW and then you death... I mean, you Death Trooper terminate POW, and then the fight is just over? I think it probably depends on the data cron and, and yeah, the comp. Yeah, how close like, to 400% I, I, I defense was that cron dagger? How close to 400 would you say? Uh, About 355% away, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I'll, I'll joke aside. Uh, like, I, I think I, I still think Aiden is a winnable fight there. Um, especially uh, with the attacker crown. The attacker crown plus Death Trooper is really nasty. I would say the Swiggo disagrees with you, sir. But I, I, I tried I, it, and uh, it was it was not like that. I will tell I will tell I will tell you that attacker crown and all. <laughs> I just think it's a skill gap. It could be. It could huh. be. There's I mean, a, fundamentally, wouldn't the dynamic be more of like a ball check? Like, there's a matchup that plays exactly like this recently, actually. I think it's something to do with Great Mother Kron, but, like, right now it feels like we're... Like, uh, yeah, this, this year is very, very fucking bulk-focused, but, like, now more than ever, there are multiple matchups where it's, like, if you can be this tall that, like, you know, what, like, 33 or 25% of your team's regen is higher than massive damage, you can just trivialize a game plan like that. Or no, I, yeah. I think like one dynamic of it is like uh, Gideon Crown against Great Mothers that they just because their pools are so inflated that they just like I I, I beat a Great Mothers team that it was just like someone who owned Great Mothers but didn't own Morgan and so they posted with Spirit and it's like no I I Gideon ruled that easily I went with that mm. Morgan's in the squad I didn't even try it but I just I just assumed and other people that I talked to confirmed is like yeah no. Morgan's regeneration just gaps you out, and so 
if we're talking Aiden versus Pow, I'd imagine Pow's massive damage is probably the reason why you lost it, and also probably how you would try to attack that and try to beat it. Yeah, and I of do course, think that, I that went just... after Pow. Yeah, and it just yeah, it did not pan out, oh, man. No, no, I I, I agree. I'm almost just trying to touch it, Tass. But I think that's one of those splits, Tass, that you're talking about. Like when you can put a 400 percent defense data crown on something, the actual team barely matters. Well, I mean, it matters a little because it, it took a few things. It took a well, few things no, to no. get through. You know, you know the point I'm trying to make. Like, yeah, you can make a decent defensive team out of almost anything at that level yeah. of defense. I take your point, but yeah, there was there was still enough stretch on my roster where, eh, it, it you know it it was going to be a challenge no matter what I did. And oh yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not I'm not arguing. I'm mostly just poking fun, but yeah. I, 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 I don't think that split is good for people who don't have, like, those massive crons to brick wall I Possibly, yeah. Possibly. Because, like I said, I fought against one, and it had, like, 80% defense-ish. Mm -hmm. And, I, I I mean, it also was not, like, an R9 pal, right? It was just, like, you know, generic R7 pal. But it got rolled pretty hard by Death Trooper. Fair. Fair. Yeah, um, you would be shocked to learn that I did, in fact, fight a Relic 9 pal. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that's what... Yeah. Wow, it's almost like you heard what I said. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly so. All right, if nobody has any other notes on those splits, um, I know we wanted to cover Enoch and DTP, uh, which enabled a different split with Night Trooper. TJ, you had a note on that? Yeah, I, it was, I guess, I saw Zareth and Solo talking about it too, and I, I didn't get to face it all season, but um, came into play, uh, Reigns last round put it in. I... And the idea is pretty cool, doing the alert level six and then his uh, level nine on the Datacron. Super cool idea. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't play with that setup. If you go read it, it, it gives a wealth of uh, little bonus added things that if you're not taking care of it, it's going to well, screw you pretty well. And, and I know you didn't specify, but I think I know what you mean. You're talking about the DTP level nine, right? Right. So right. whenever, whenever the, DTP the, crits an enemy, he gains damage immunity for one turn, can't be copied. 25% turn meter and blinds that enemy for one turn, which can't be evaded or resisted. If the enemy was target locked, DTP also gains protection up 100%, stacking, retribution, and speed up for two turns. It's a lot. All right. So so what made this, you know, you so you had Enoch, DTP, and, and who was the third on that team you fought? Um... I don't remember. It wasn't good. No, I took JMK. I had it. I had it in the way. It didn't first. matter because you weren't playing with it regardless. Okay, <laughs> I would, fine. Because I was reading the, the, the concept of it, right? And it was yeah. like, this is not one where you want to die on the hill just because if you don't get to kill it correctly, what DTP is doing with that alignment was a, a pretty big shift. Mm -hmm. um, and I know we'll talk about it, but the DTMG being still set up with Night Trooper was a great. So that split was pretty cool and being able to, okay. to keep that option and nothing you wanted to mess with just in case because if you start getting into the immunities or something else, that that felt really bad. Yeah, also, I'd be curious to know where his scout trooper was in either trio. It was with the D-Team G. Okay. Remember to pick up a stormtrooper cron. Yeah, for the turn meter reduction, right? For, for the for the for next for next up for the next three v three, because you're gonna split these teams. Right? So make make sure you're picking up uh Make sure you're picking that one up. That one's going to be really good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. All right. Um, you also didn't have it written down, but as someone who saved Queen Amidala all month, Ooh, yeah. I think like she was... I don't know what the next concept is going to be, obviously. It's probably going to have some mercenary, some bullshit on it. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say, that team beat the Stormtrooper Han Kron... BJMK. Yep. Yeah. Like the ceiling. That, that, that Queen Amidala squad was the determining factor in both of my real matches this week. Uh, like, it's just, I mean, the support Kron, this is its last appearance in, in 3v3. So we'll see what she's got working for her next time we come back. But um, that great support Kron with high defense was, was nuts. I had it in, in the back where I think. Uh, against Aesop, he probably had assumed I had held Queen Amidala for offense. I didn't. I had it in the back wall. Uh, he lost 20 battles on it and couldn't clear it. Uh, and then, uh, you know, it. I think it was the deciding factor in, uh, I mean, 
Partick did a bunch of stuff right in that in that battle that I had with him. But one of the things was he saved his Queen Amidala, didn't set it on D, and was able to one shot my Leia in the back with it. Like it was yeah. uh, it was huge. Um, I, I wanted it on defense because it's just it's so fun having like a, a really potent defense and getting those holds like it against Aesop is great. Mm-hmm. But I instinctively I was thinking I bet the 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 better move trying to win is probably holding it on offense because it clears almost everything. I'll say I failed. I had the one uh, chance of a fail with the queen against the STH uh, setup. They got they got around it, and then I got stuck on the taunt, um, and it was just enough to pop my queen on my dollar. Did you take the support? Was Drogon in the third? Of course. Did did you did you hold your dispel with queen on my dollar? No, open up the dispel with queen on my dollar to start hitting the damage. And start ramping the buffs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I do with that fight is I hold her dispel to make sure that the taunt isn't on Stormtrooper on with the buff immunity. I think it's fair. I I, I could see that definitely no, no, being the saying, one. I'm not saying you misplayed or anything. I'm just saying that. Oh I, no, I agree. I got, no, I, I think there's a good call. Stormtrooper on in one of my fights and was still able to mm-hmm. pull it out. And then I just started holding her dispel until. I think it's. A- I think it's a good call. I think that's a yeah. great piece. We don't get to use it now, right? But I think that that one piece. Yeah. But yeah, that's exactly what happened, right? So I wanted to start getting the buffs to getting her the logic to kick in. And yeah, I was with uh, Drogon as the third. Uh, but yeah. it was just a good enough setup where I couldn't get to it fast enough. And then they pop my pal. And once your pal is dead, your team is dead. You've, yeah, you've... that's another reason to mod for health really quick. Um, because if you're going to fight against something like Drogon who goes under your prot, you definitely want both of those characters health. Stand. And he did, man. Pal was, Pal was pooped. And when Pal was pooped, there went the team. And I will say that mine held as well. And I have a sneaking suspicion it was their queen. And if I had to guess, probably the same thing happened in one of the fights. Obviously, we don't have the data. But it, yeah. it, it, everybody, everybody, I didn't see it. And I even told Tass in one of our little shenanigans, I was like, to me, the best thing in the back because everybody's keeping it, is putting that queen. So it, it kind of look look at what Sasha's saying. It, it completely tracks that it just that in the back because everybody's so prone to want to keep it because they don't want to deal with the Leia, which was the staple defense character or our team. Yeah, so putting that back there is like it's like putting a GL back there, right? Because now you you're like, oh, I still fine, and then you walk along, and then there's a there's a, a wall for you to hit. Mm-hmm. I-, I will say as a user of queen on offense all week this week uh twice on leia yeah uh one of those times i really came close to losing my power and i have just over 150 percent defense on that set 16 crown that i was using so i imagine that it would be you know quote unquote safe at 200 plus but that's a pretty high threshold and obviously well, we won't be having that back next time so in a mix of health if you're going against Leia, you also want a mix of health on that cron. Mm. Because, yeah, the, the hots will pull you back out. Yeah, I didn't have that. I didn't have any health on it. I just had, a, I had like, I want to say 50% crit damage and, a, and 150% defense. So, you know, if I had had more defense or the health instead of the crit damage, probably would have felt safer. Yeah, because I, I was rocking with 100% defense and 40% health, and nothing felt close. Hmm. All right. Fair enough. No, that's a good point, though. Uh, queen on offense. That's a good one. Um, yeah, yeah. Like Lord mm-hmm. Vader, Malgus, uh, Savage. She beats Savage. So, like, that's another like thing that she does. That's interesting. Gungans. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, it's more of like like what Sasha said. The question is more of what doesn't she beat versus what does what do, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, certainly for um, this last. You know, hurrah, set 16, anyway. I, I have a feeling... Well, I mean, you have the Qui-Gon Kron coming up, so, I mean, I assume yeah. the Qui-Gon that I stun Kron is going to do... Like, the only things I can think of that you'd struggle against without the support Kron also use support Krons or tank Krons. Mm-hmm. So, we'll see. Oh, very good. R- really enjoyed that team on offense. I think a lot of more people are going to learn how to use that team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I eagerly embraced using that team on offense. The The satisfaction of that pow swipe is just mwah. All right. Also, basicing Leia for 280k always feels good. <sighs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I fought in the third round uh, Leia that had tank revive on the cron, so she came back, and it's like, okay, so we have to do this again, lady. And then, like, <laughs> next, next basic, and she died. It was good. Yeah. <laughs> I had fun. I had fun. All right, really uh, quick, really quick, Sasha. 
did do you do you echo our like hey, have you tried this team on offense? So I know you said you played it on defense, but uh you have any Yeah, I think I tried it once uh once last week on offense to clear a Leia. Uh I just saw uh, an uh, opponent I, I knew would be setting Leia, and that was, I thought, my most sensible option. So I did that, and it was nice. It maybe took a little bit to ramp, and then uh, suddenly, like, you, you one shot and blow up a GL. That's pretty cool. But uh, I, I, uh, I I have been at, finding, like, in the this meta, which we're just transitioning out of, has been, like, a serious blood sport. Like, it's been a lot of fun, the matches that I've had. In fact, like, I think I've only been cleared once, uh, and I've only cleared maybe like t- two times. Like it's been uh, like pretty intense defenses, and this is one of those defenses, like we've been saying, that is like the least forgiving if you don't have a proper counter. Yeah. So it just became too appealing to have in the back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What about you, Fatal? Have you gotten any experience with clean on offense? I am the last person who will ever pull a team like Nazi offense. I regret to inform. No, no it's... <laughs> Yeah. It's hard. No, no, I won't be doing it. What? Mm-hmm. No, more, more than Reaper. I, I yeah, think Fatal is that good more of likely. He, he, Fatal was probably more likely to set Queen, Queen Amidala with two different Galactic Republic characters than Pow and Master Qui Gon and find a completely different <laughs> use for them than he would be to take them to offense. Yeah. <laughs> Fair. Uh, All right, our last item, guys, um, before we talk about the best attack and defense. No, actually, let's do that, and then we'll talk about Shin Merrick after that. It seems to make more sense to me. So best attack and defense of the week. Um, Defense, for me, I really liked the split in the back of DTMG, Knight, Scout, and then Lord Vader, Gideon, Royal. Uh, Not claiming to have come up with it, just saying I found it really effective. I, I found that when I was planning... I didn't feel like I necessarily needed uh, DTMG with you know Gideon for offense, and so I decided to run with that. And I got holds. I, it was partially determinant for one of my wins. So I like that one a lot. Um, offense wise, I mean, you know, favorite attack doesn't always have to be a winner. I just need more practice with uh, Mother Taryn. Uh, Mother Taryn. God. Mother <laughs> Tall's and Marin. Mother Taryn. Jeez. Jeez. I don't know Malico's transition. Congrats to him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We are forward thinking here. Yeah. yeah. You, you got you to live your real life. Yeah. So anyway. Um, <laughs> oh, that's just... why he moved to Dathomir. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, he, he's, he, I heard he's okay with Sam. Yeah. You, you move, you move to Dathomir when you're going mad anyway, and then you blame it on the madness there. It's like, ah, this place, you know, it's so bad for you. <laughs> We don't judge. There's no team shaming guy. <laughs> but anyway, though, um, seriously, Mother Tall's and Marin Asajj, I <laughs> just was careless with it, and I need to practice it more. Because uh, if I was cleaner on that, or I didn't have Dash Han Chewie fail for me for the first time against a very high defense again, uh, Trench, Django, and Watt, man, it, w- it would have been an, a win right there. So... Good, good times, good times. How about you, Dagger? Favorite defense and attack of the week? Um, yeah. So I started this week in the mid three hundreds, and I just uh, put Jabba, uh, DTMG, or no, I, I don't remember what my front wall was. I just placed my front wall down, and uh, people just impaled themselves because I was bigger, I was fatter, I was longer. I'm still talking about my account. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, and my, and my favorite attack is still I got Star Killer to work versus Ray all three rounds against uh, against uh, Ray Ben Nest. Mm-hmm. And that was either orientation of Nest. What do you mean either orientation of Nest? Like, either like the revive. Nine. He's talking about the revive level nine. Mm-hmm. Uh, the revive level nine wouldn't have changed anything. It was just whack a mole. Like Ray died in the first forty five seconds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like she just uh, like she just dies so fast, especially if you take the support cross. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Star Killer's hitting for like three hundred k on basics, and you can have you eventually just. And I had one of my fights against uh, Nest. The Nest was only R seven. This Nest was only R seven, but she had like she. I had done like the 
MJ assist and the EP assist, and then Starkiller took his turn and one-shot her. He didn't take a turn. He just one-shot her. <laughs> With all that, like, stacking bonus prod. Just, and you're gone. I, I did that once as well this season. I was impressed with how hard you can hit through that bonus protection. It was, uh, yeah. I, it's rare to see that. But with the support cron, not with the uh, attacker cron. So that adjustment made that fight like just easy breezy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. TJ, how about you? Your favorite attack and defense of the week? My favorite defense is the one that Tass stole from me, which mm-hmm. would be the back wall fuckwad. Um, but the, I think one piece that I think you missed, Tass, that, that helped out with that and actually did very well was that DTP lined up, and that was through your suggestion. So to me, it was a, kind of like a trifecta. They were both bottom front, so the bottom front having the the uh, the sisters with the DTP, it held rounds one and two, and then on both holds, it took three attempts to kill it. Nice. So that combo, and then you put the back wall of having that Gideon. Uh, round one opponent didn't clear. It took six attacks into my LV with DT uh, with Gideon, and didn't clear, it, and they just stopped from that fight. Um, and then again, that was my holds all week. So I think to me that combo of that up front with those in the back served a great purpose. All right, fair enough. Yes, strategy definitely mattered more in in week three than uh, weeks one yeah. and two, for sure. Yeah, I would say. It, it, it's just that funnel you, to me. Good on you for coming out as a bottom, TJ. That's uh, not something many men would admit. Well, it can't be really a bottom when I'm the one giving the information. So that makes me more of the top and somebody else receiving. So. But again, we don't king shame here. Who are, who are we not to be forward thinking people? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. Uh, Sasha, how about you? How was, uh, you know, what your favorite attack and defense of the week was? You know, I, for attack, part of it was, yeah, I had, uh, like so I mentioned, this entire uh, three week season has been uh, a hell of a mess. Uh, I mean, I've, I've been pleased with my defenses and embarrassed of my offensive performance. So anytime I could find a decent solution to some of the major pains in my ass, I was very happy. And I had had a couple of fails using Bane against Queen Amidala squads. Uh, so I no longer felt comfortable with that because um, I was facing ones with 400% defense. I, I just, maybe I didn't have sufficient uh, armor pen on any of my datacrons, but I, I'd struggled with that. But finding Bane working smoothly against Saw, Luthen, and uh, frankly, like I did it twice, Saw, Luthen, once Drogon, once Saw, Luthen, and Krex, that, uh, it, you know, if you told me, you know, a few weeks ago, I would have figured that would be a sure thing. But for me, it was just a huge relief to be able to have something that seemed comfortable against a, a Saw Luthen squad. Um, so that was up there for me. That was like one of the few things that worked consistently on offense. Uh, and then uh, defense, we already talked about this. Queen Amidala, I had a few different drops uh, that, that I got from folks, but a lot of times it was just because they were throwing everything against, like in Aesop, I mentioned there were 20 attacks against Queen Amidala. So a few other things held. I had like, you know, Goofy, like Nest, Queel, IG-11 with a really nice Nest Kron. No doubt a player of Aesop's caliber is going to steamroll that, but it was, you know, it still got a hold. But I, I'm sure it's just because Queen Amidala, you know, got basically everything up to the kitchen sink. So that was the that was the difference maker uh, for me. Um, yeah, I, I mean, nothing else stands out without having actually seen the history and what uh, anybody else has used. So there may be nuggets of like uh, right. of. Cool finds, but fun, I don't fun have fact, that. viewers, uh, everyone at home. Yes, yeah, Swagger GG hadn't updated yet by the time of our recording here. We usually try to, you know, have that available for this, but yeah, not week, today. week three, week three, it doesn't update till Wednesday. Hey, um, but no, I I'm with you, Sasha. I, I used Bane versus uh versus uh Saw once too. I generally go, for, I generally opt for the budget JML. Um, mm-hmm. that's the budget option. <laughs> Uh, God, that he does not feel like a fucking GL right now. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Stick him with Plo. That can do some serious stuff. But uh, yeah, uh, well, no, that's yeah. I believe that. I believe that for sure. All right, yeah, I think we're gonna have a really quick. I, sure, go ahead. I guess this kind of parlays. I'll save it for when we talk. Are we gonna talk about the next three v three? Yeah, absolutely. We can cover that a little bit. Yeah, because I was just say I think. 
that this current set that just came out is going to shine next 3v3 because we just opted out of a lot of the level 9s because we have the really cracked set previously. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I really, really look forward to being able to utilize Plo, the Plo Kron. I want to find a use for the Ekoth Kron because, like, the the old Krons are just better. <laughs> um, in 3v3, at least. Uh, yeah, I really look forward to this set because, man... How many Jedi teams can you make in 3v3 that that yeah. didn't... Man, it's going to be fun. There's a lot of 3v3 teams with Jedi. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and defense stat is still all over set 17, so defense will still be part of next 3v3 meta uh, all over. Very fair. Uh, Fatal, how about your favorite attack and defense of the week? What you got? Uh, to be honest, nothing really specific stands out. It's just a end result of being the favorite and the natural conclusion of my play style. Mm -hmm. right, I spread people wide and go for fatigue play style. And, I mean, the, the lower my rank gets, it, it, I always call it as like a life draft or something. Is like, it, At some point, it's literally impossible for my rank to drop past a certain point because the defense... I literally, I, I would just have to not attack, which is technically what happened once this season. But. <laughs> what kind of madman would just not attack, right? The, there were multiple matches this season where an opponent had between like two or 500 points, and it wasn't because any one team was unique or did anything specific. It's just like, no, man, I, I have placed multiple rakes into my defense, and if you step on one, then it's probably teeing you up to... Or forcing you to step on more later until you're just... It's just not a pleasant place to be in. And so by the time that it comes around to me attacking, I can just do the laziest, worst, you know, dumbest for fun attacks possible. And Very nice. still roughly get away with it. Uh, mostly, I guess, it's just uh, Night Sisters did well in offense against Jabba towards <laughs> the end of the year. I, I still think Attacker Kron probably had me in a sort of checkmate and the one thing i didn't explore is having set 17 pick up the tenacity work and then just going like full bulk mods or something like that to try to contest it but still even then right it's like yeah. that dynamic there is fully just did they attack your marin or not but you know, I think I got punished once or twice at the start of the season, but towards the tail end, I got to fight a bunch of Jabba's and just did not get punished or, or very much at all. Fantastic. That, I, I don't know. It, it, it kind of continued to work out. I, I, I actually don't think I've completely solved that matchup. There were a couple of things that I realized of, like, you know, when I was fighting, like, support Jabba and I knew that uh, Bausch was about to do her AoE with the stacked crit damage, I dodged it with magic stealth and that actually, like, bailed me out and set me up for a win i think um strategically reviving yourself because my datacron was very good at keeping my team alive when i needed them to die yeah. and so that put me in a position to like have to work on the matchup of like okay job is about to ult soon he's on four that's going into five let me start to revive myself or like kill my tm train so that i can't make protection so that he can kill talzin and then that worked and like that let me through that I guess I, I would say that was a bit of violent. It's like, okay, that's a bit of mechanical skill that I had to put out, but I didn't have to put out prior. So that that was cool. Hmm. Fair. You know, I, I mentioned the one that I bungled, but the one that I didn't bungle and I still nonetheless lost is where I had uh, Mother Talz and, and Asajj dead, and I was on auto basic, and we were stacking up going just fine. And then... The high turn meter Jabba did, in fact, get that next turn used as ultimate and, you know, topped himself back off and, you know, damned our chance of the one shot. I wonder if you know what that was about, because we were well and truly in the loop. And I don't understand how he interceded on us there. Yeah, so functionally, the killing Jabba is just a function of time. And so, for example, like, if you successfully get to Baron last woman standing, you can just... Like, if you know the job is about to ult, as long as you just make sure that you maintain the uh, instant defeat immunity, 
you can just repeatedly let him take turns, cycle the ult out. Because basically what can happen is if, if you know that, okay, within like whatever, two or three Java turns, he's going to threaten ult. That wipes out all the progress and all the time that you put in prior. So let's say you go into a Java race with like three minutes, right? Yeah. And then you hit auto basic, but then a minute and a half in the ult cycles. You've lost that minute and a half, and you're probably not going to get it done with that last minute and a half. Right. That if you know that's a threat on the table, you definitely. It's something that I used to do. I, I, I guess I'm kind of just in a spot where it hasn't come up recently because I haven't really had to think about it. But yeah, 100%. That's what you do in that spot is you selectively let it cycle first so that you diffuse that bomb and then you just hit the auto basic because even if he ults right it's not like a team revive or anything it'll heal himself to right. tops but then you know you'll be two and a half to uh, two minutes 15 seconds left on the clock and you can still easily just run him down uh for your rank though the other because I, oh, no, no, I did lose one this season hmm. and I, I i figured it was going to be a loss and i did the early game was a little bit tricky that I did take a few, you know, 20, 30 seconds to think. But I think even if I hadn't done that pause, I think I would still lose. I lost to a 380% defense crown. And uh, that's just kind of, to a degree, it's unavoidable, right? Like, the way the counter runs now, you do have to worry about your damage, Jabba, right? Like, in, in the era of the play crown, you could literally kill Jabba exclusively via the plague percentage even though it's reduced to almost zero on a gl you just printed a thousand or two thousand of it that you you could kill a gl with percent health damage and that was just how absurd it was but yeah the uh 308 percent defense stonewalled me I, you know i probably would have won in like 45 or 50 more seconds but i just kind of what you're saying but just an extension of it the matchup can be a function of time, and okay. the ults interacts with that, and defense grounds interact with that. That like, unironically, can be a factor in okay. high level play. Okay, well, yeah, I appreciate you breaking that down. Yeah, that uh, that fight's just something I eat more practice with. So I'll I'll have the chance again. Uh, so all right, so nothing else otherwise stuck out for you, Fatal. Let's check back in with the agenda here. Yeah, um, let's talk about Shin and Maroc here. So we're some weeks away from Balin's kit being announced, let alone him joining us in the game. Uh, how are you guys thinking you might make use of these characters ahead of Balin joining? Well, Merrick's actually really good. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously we haven't got our hands on him yet as of this recording. He isn't but, in game, right? Not yet. No. Okay. No. Okay. But he looked he looks really good. And I'm not saying anything mean about Shin, but she I guess kinda can she's pro she's probably better than Fulcrum on Seer if you have her. Um but eh. I don't know if she like toggles that team up or down at all. Probably not. I heard people flexing her a little bit here in threes, and nobody came back with anything that sounded impressive. At least yeah, early like on. I, I, think she's, I think temporarily, she's if you have her built, she's just like a Fulcrum replacement on Seer. I haven't really seen a ton of her doing amazing stuff. Fatal's one of our testers slash theory crafters. I could probably have more on that. I have thoughts, but I'll save them towards the end okay okay not not the end of the show but just like the end of this segment i mean yeah, sure yeah, yeah. fair i mean it's for my part i can show you what i've got cooking with shin just like a, a generic setup that seems good and, and i appreciate tj because uh he he mentioned something i forgot about some aspect of, oh yeah it was the crit avoidance yeah, this character does want a crit avoidance arrow, so the way I ended up setting her up was just over 300 speed, crit damage triangle. I put her in a potency cross, and then between that and just a little bit of potency through secondaries, have her just over 100%. She does have a AoE turn meter increase, a couple debuffs worth putting out, so some amount of added potency. Uh, strong offense secondary on the potency cross got her up over 10,000 physical she with very little crit chance added it's over 90% crit chance 
So I feel like that's a decent default. Obviously, depending on what Balin's lead is passing out, this could be significantly overhauled. But that's at least as far as mod setup is. is in terms of application, yeah, nothing brilliant comes to mind right now. She doesn't seem to fit anywhere great. I don't know what, if you guys are doing anything different. I, I want to see, for me personally, I, uh, I like, so what, what uh, I think what Diger says is true. I, I think there's something there. Um, I know the whole Soldier of Fortune and stuff like that, but when I was reading the kit, what seems interesting to me is the turn meter gains and what it can do. Uh, how does that play out with uh, Riva? If we're talking about three specifically, there's a lot of build-in of keeping that stored up. And it, depending on what we see, uh, for the next set, is is that the seventh replacement? Because I don't think you're you know you're not you're not pulling out what GI can do, um, but it feels like uh, Merrick will be really good in that team. It's got a whole bunch of applications for team gains and just making things uh, more of a fun fight, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I ha I don't have uh, much of the com the kit committed to memory as of yet but any matchups you're potentially just you know you read the kit and you're like oh i wonder if this enables that matchup or improves uh, that matchup i i don't i think we have to wait for dc if you want me to be honest sure um, sure sure, sure. I, I, I just think it's uh it's generically Fatal's, good but not clear Fatal's how talked yet. about the puzzles right now i always like the word because he does the puzzles i think it's an interesting puzzle to the fight um uh, if you're starting to mess with things and if you know if we're always set to the same uh, semblance of the team, right? Everything goes this way. You know, there's a chance for seventh to respawn or to uh, get the turn meter. This is what's going to happen with GI. Uh, Merrick has some identity in there to keep adding in. So if somebody resists or something happens with the um, uh, their stuff, I think that's cool. And then also there's the, the passive turn meter gains that are going to happen in that. Can you just mess with your fight? Of, oh, I didn't expect him to go already. What happened here? Also, this is this this is kind of sort of a non sequitur, but I, I find it amusing that uh, CG tends to gate uh, power levels of characters behind their bespoke data crons. For example, like uh, Pow got one, but Qui Gon didn't because once you had both of them, they functioned. Um, and neither of these characters got their own data cron because they're both just good. Like uh, you can use them out of the box, so to speak. I don't know. Who you replace it like in five v five because we're because you know I think you replace eighth maybe with uh Merrick temporarily. Um, it really just depends because he he gives a, he gives a fair amount of uh, utility there, and the team doesn't really lack damage. In threes, I don't really think he has a home with Inquisitors, and by the time the next three v three comes around, we'll have Balin. Presumably, we'll have Balin. Or we'll be talking about Balin for week two, <laughs> right? One of those kind of things, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, I don't, I don't know where I would even think about using him until I knew we did. We wouldn't have Balin. All right. All right, Fatal. I think we're about done on that segment. So jump on in. All right. So, if I'm doing some tea leaf reading here, I, I have a few balls that I think I can call with like twenty percent confidence. <laughs> um, okay. cold, cold take is we'll get Balin, he's coming with the Datacron we know this, it'll probably be like Grandmother Datacron, sure, so Balin comes out uh, he'll be on defense for a while I would imagine, I would fucking hope I guess, I don't know uh, <laughs> past that point though if you look at Ezra's kit and you look at Merrick's kit, I think at this point it's it's almost not even subtle that I think CG is pretty blatantly teeing up that Balin will be a common counter to Ahsoka. That if you look at, for example, uh, Ezra's kit, the, Ezra's kit already gave me the idea that I think Ahsoka is going to be a Jedi Ufu bridge. I mean, again, maybe not even that crazy to think. It's just like, hey, he's got calls for both. That's weird. And then Merrick, the unique, has calls for both. And then you look at Merrick, is printed with text such as. Whenever a mercenary gets resisted, you, the team gains 10% meter or something. And then you look at, hmm, well, Ezra has a shitload of tenacity built into his kid and his team 
that it sure would seem like CG is planting the seeds to allow uh, mercenaries to just get an absolutely insane TM train given the opportunity. That's weird. That, it, like, it it seems like it's entirely possible that all this would be bullshit, but it really does seem to me, like, in a semi cynical way that, like, you're going to get your Balin pay to, wa- pay to win Kron, and then it almost implies to me that Ahsoka might have some defensive viability and that they're almost kind of creating a problem and then selling a solution in the form of Balin at the same time. That, I don't, I don't know if that's, that'll be true, but I, I think a lot of puzzle pieces snap in just the right way is that that's kind of my assumption or expectation of the near future. I think that will be the dynamic going on between these characters. Okay. And as long as as long as it's similar to like the Star Killer versus Ray where it works most seasons, I think it's probably fine. There's gonna be a well, lot then... of unhappy people because uh Balin's gonna be just skull fucking her with that data crowd. Well, I mean she's not coming until December. Well, he's coming what, November? So she's yeah, November. Late December. Yeah, she left three months of Balin skull fucking Ahsoka. Hmm. Yeah, two or three or something, but like, yeah. But again, dep- depending on how Ahsoka hits, if she's defensively viable, and he's defensively viable, ooh, there's friction. Yeah. What, what if you want to yeah. bust both? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So all right. So yeah, some prognostication about how they might be applied with Balin, but no bright ideas jumping at you here for the early part of this you know, this near future where there is no Balin. Oh, for using them? I I just assume they're not even real units. I don't even treat them as existing. Merrick, I mean, that that unique... Yeah. The unique requires the Inquisitors to be proactive to be able to cash in the cleanse, right? That it wouldn't have anything to do with Phoenix. I don't think Mm -hmm. Phoenix will still just kind of go for the lockdown plan because their Terminator train happens automatically, and this is a reactive solution to a automatic proactive game plan i don't know look if, if seventh sister if seventh sister hyrule is like a captain rex days but do you really want to waste your inquisitor team on like a 15 percent what if type situation i don't know i i assume the character isn't going to be all that real maybe you get some cute c usage out of the cleanse synergy for some inquisitor matchup but yeah for the most part I mean, I'm, I'm kind of treating these characters how I treat most Conquest units, which is like until the Conquest unit is out, the kit reveal is like kind of fun to think about, and then I just forget about it for three months. And these characters, it's like, technically I can use them, sure. It's kind of fun to think about, but I'm not going to post. I, I post Seer on defense. I'm, I am that guy. I'm that pervert. I'm not putting shit on that team. I No. <laughs> Absolutely not. All right. Oh, I was Fair mostly enough. speaking to five v. How I was mostly speaking to how I don't think either of these characters have three v three applications. No. <laughs> I was mostly that. That was the point I try. I tried to make when I'm like, in in fives you can replace Fulcrum. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hear you. Like, right. you, you I, don't I, even I want to replace Fulcrum though. Fulcrum I don't think so actual. either. I think she's better. I I'll mean, defend her honor. Yeah. You know, look. All I'm all I'm saying is you have like one kind of like extraneous damage dealer on the team, and yeah. it could be either. Here, here's one that... other ball that I will call is I. So we're about to enter. Well, not about to. Once set sixteen goes, people are going to have to square away the fact that Qui Gon is unironically better at damage than Pow is, despite you know the flavor of the team would seem like. Well, Pow is the hyper carry, and it's like mm, no. <laughs> Not even, not even, it's not a, it, in order for it to be a rivalry, it's got to be, you know, semi-close, and it's not fucking close, right? Like, you put Cam in the team, it is, it's nitrous to Master Quagun and Pao is, you know, doing half of his. So, but, I suspect, because CG is called Balin a bruiser, and for a character to be a bruiser and not a tank, that implies that they will do damage. I, and you also see Shin as being kind of printed with a fair amount of utility within her kit and not mm-hmm. necessarily just doing damage. I think we'll have a similar dynamic to Qui-Gon and Pao. I think Balin will probably end up being a lot of the meat and potatoes and Shin. I mean, we're kind of entering this era of the game where CG is exploring these kind of 
hybridized roles, right? You have Ezra who crits people, but not necessarily to do damage up front, but to get effects. Mm -hmm. And to some degree, I, I do think characters like Pow and possibly even Shin could be doing similar roles where, you know, they are providing critical functions to the team, but they are not necessarily the guy or the gal. And for the record, folks, we're, when, you, when you're board. saying POW, you're meaning Padawan Obi-Wan, not POW. Yes. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah. I forgot that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Problems with our but, language. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for catching me. Um, <laughs> yes, Padawan Obi-Wan yes. is not the best damage dealer of the team. It, it is not even close. What, what, oh, sorry. No, just I'm, I'm saying what Datacron's out of the picture, right? Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pal -cron, Pal -cron shifted that. Attacker Kron, yeah, of course, infinite skill and crit damage. Yeah, sure. Yeah, great. But now that we're kind of regressing back to a more normally balanced game, the reality of the situation is kind of coming home to roost. But, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah, uh, I would also say really quick regarding uh, sure. Balin being a bruiser. Yeah. Like when we think about the bruisers we already have in game, the first things that pop into mind are like Ray, to a degree, both Ma both uh, Malakos and Star Killer, because you want to bulk them plus offense them. Um, I don't think of them as bruisers. Bruisers are functionally meant to take damage, right? I understand. I understand. I'm thinking about how you mod them. Yeah. When I think C CG bruiser, I'm thinking call him Reva. The... I think Reva Bo when I think one. bruiser. Well, Sorry. Go ahead. Sure. I mean, Reva's a tank, though, not a bruiser. I, I don't think CG. I, I don't think Galaxy of Heroes has ever actually had a true bruiser. And CG called this out when they announced Balin, and I, I think I would probably agree with it. The thing that's funny about this is kind of the broader issue that, like, I mean, bruiser is a term that I think largely originated around League of Legends. Not that, like, I know League's not the sure, mobile, yeah. Anymore, right? But like, I think the community kind of originated that bruisers in League of Legends have been like a nightmare to balance. That, mm -hmm. in a funny way, Riot saying we're gonna make a bruiser is has some subtext and implications of like, you know, there are worlds where like, I mean, Scion I think would be like the first character that was kind of positioned in that space, but just had these massive issues that like, I mean, let me tell you, man, it is so depressing to play Scion with a Tankron and to see signs of life of like. Literally, CG should just take the text from the level six of tank datacrons and give it to Scion. As I would say, Omicron, but just give it to him as a rework so he could just use it everywhere. The character's kit suddenly snaps into place. Like, right? His basic has a self funds. So, like, if, a, if an ally calls him to assist and he assists, he cleans himself up, which is something that's pretty good for tanks to be doing these days. Like, mm. but. That character can actually do some respectable damage and, like, is kind of in the vein of a bruiser. And then we, we entered this kind of era of hell scaling. Maul kind of did it. Ray did it, but defensively, Malgus has kind of done it. Now we're kind of entering this era of offense matters, but also we want them to be hard to kill. And what the fuck does that mean? Mm -hmm. Does that mean that you would qualify Bo as kind of a bruiser? Eh... I don't. I don't even know what I would call her. Period. She's a <laughs> she, she's a combo piece. That's fair. I'm just saying she's relatively thick and hits reasonably hard. Yeah, has the utility. I, I like the idea of thinking about something like Malgus or Reva better because uh, Reva's not a bruiser though. She's just a straight up fucking tank. Well, let me qualify the case because I, first of all, I don't think you can be considered a bruiser. I agree with Fatal's interpretation that the the terms largely from League of Legends. And to my mind, you're on the front line. Like there's you're you're not having somebody else covering you. That's why you're there. All right, you are there for that, and you also do appreciable damage over the course of an extended engagement. Right, you don't have great burst damage, but you offer something compelling damage-wise over the course of an extended fight. And I think of, I think Reva and Malgus both fit in that role to me. I understand how you mean that they're properly serving as tanks, and I, I don't disagree. But their Reva their damage do feels more bruisery, and that's why I think of them that way. So Reva so doesn't really do damage. Reva's like a utility tank. She does. I I don't know. I feel like she does a, an appreciable bop with that middle of hers. 
has a lot of offense on her, and she doesn't do a ton of damage. She does some. Yeah. But, like, with, she does, like, tank damage, not... I would... Exactly. You would distinguish well, do, do you guys it from know the a lore true about damage Riva? dealer. Right. Sorry, go ahead. Do you guys know the lore about her release? Uh, about Reva's release? Was no, I'm curious to hear she, she, she was an attacker, and her ma yeah. relic mastery is based on attacker mastery, that she doesn't actually get the tank level 9 benefits. Really? And, and then I reported to CG that the level 9 was not giving her what she should get, that she's getting way less than what she should get, and CG knows about it, and they actually chose to keep her as is. Hmm. She, she was designed in that space, but I actually kind of tend to agree with Dagger that I don't really think of her as a bruiser. Like, mm -hmm. yes, the middle does bop occasionally, mm -hmm. but, but in terms of the role, right? I mean, this is kind of... This is why I'm curious to see Balin's kit, because how, how do you elicit the feel of a bruiser in Galaxy Heroes is an yeah. interesting question. Yeah. I, I think one thing that's going to be key is it's going to be the need to create a character who feels like they can shrug off a lot of debuff attempts and possibly whack you back at the same time while doing it, right? It, it's kind of going to be this... Kind of what you get with, like... I mean, Malagas has a lot of good rules for, like, you can't do this to me, you can't do that to me, I I'm okay with this happening. But when he counterattacks you, it's not felt immediately, right? He's stacking his health that you will get punished for later on a health, on his percent health yeah. nuke. But it's not felt immediately, right? Like, ima imagine if a character like Malagas was actually, you know, it doesn't even have to be crits or offense. Like, let's say... Every time he counterattacks you, he does 10 or 20 or 25% of his health per basic. And all of a sudden, those counterattacks, which can happen fairly often to you in those fights, all of a sudden become a, oh, holy shit, this is <laughs> kind of not okay. Mm -hmm. The way I view, the way I view, like after just like thinking about it briefly here while and listening to you talk about Malgus, I think the way that you create bruisers in Swaga is just make them do health percent damage on their attack. Well, that's that's, like, that's holistically a big part of the d design space, right? Is yeah, League has some characters that just like build a bunch of attack damage or like a, have just really high base damage that they just build armor pen or whatever, and they will just mow down your squishies while having to do very little compromise. I mean, I haven't played yeah. League in years, so some of my stu stuff might be well, yeah, and then you can yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just yeah, trying I mean, to make analogous terms here. It makes sense. Yeah, and I, I think Malgus is a good uh, example of someone like you were describing, where when you put it with Malgus, you have two tanks, so you can make the argument that he's not the tank on a lot of his teams. And that's kind of the way I de I kind of decipher bruisers is, are you the tank of your team? No. Are, like like you were saying earlier, Master Qui-Gon might end up being sort of a bruiser. I don't know what his like, actual survival splits look like, but he does health percent damage and you want to bulk him out. Fair, yeah. All right, guys. It's uh, it's been a fun season. I actually had a great time, and yeah, I mean, I expect we all expected set sixteen to dominate it. It won't be a factor next time, but yeah, like uh, like Dagger said, we'll we'll see what you know what the substitutions with set seventeen in for sixteen are gonna do. But let's go ahead and wrap this up. The takeaways, the final thoughts. Dagger, why don't you kick us off? What what do you think here? Wrapping up the season, and uh, you know what what do you kind of have on your mind going? You know what do, what are you looking to try? Maybe next time we head into threes, just based on where you know we stand now, with sixteen going out the door, seventeen still here, and eighteen not yet announced. I think this season was probably one of the more tolerable three v three seasons of recent. Not just because defense mattered, but also because I felt like there was actually like a skill gap to a degree. Like the the counters evolved from week to week. So if you were on top of things, you got rewarded, and if you weren't on top of things, you got punished. And I think that specifically feels healthier to me than previous three v three formats. Um, and I don't look forward to the next season because I imagine that the Mercenary level, mercenary crowns we're gonna get are gonna be pretty AZ, especially since we presume we'll have Balin at least like for at least a couple weeks of the next three v three. And I, oh. I just sorry. Wait, I didn't even think about mercenary level six. I mean, that's heading on shit like Afra. They're just gonna yeah. Oh, uh, actually, a lot of characters. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah that, mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not. 
I'm not looking forward to that. That feels kind of aidsy because the faction's so fucking big. Cal having a level six. Yeah. Right? Like, oh, good. Um, this is just going to be the rerun of the Ufukron, where it's just like... Yeah. Oh, huh. Hmm. Is it is yeah. it that, or or do we get even bigger and it's part of the 16 because that hmm. faction has so many areas that it gets, like, the support big, right? Because that's, that's, a, that's, that's, that's a that's a lot. Saying. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, I'm not looking forward to that in the sense that you have to, like... Man, the Kron building for next set is going to be absurd. Um, yep. <laughs> uh, but yeah, mm-hmm. I, I, I look forward to next season hopefully being similar to this season because historically I've been one of the bigger 3v3 haters on this show. And I I don't want to go as far as say that I enjoyed this season, but as I already kind of laid out, like this season felt relatively balanced and it felt rewarding uh, if you were dialed in. And mm-hmm. I appreciate that from 3v3 because that's not usually a feeling I get from this. And knowing that 5v5 coming up is going to be just back to the efficiency grind. Woohoo! It's true. It's true. All right. So, well, those are kind of my takeaways. Is I, the, the TLDR is, I, this is the closest I've come to enjoying a 3v3 season that I can remember recently. And. Man, I am waiting with bated breath for the next Data Crown set because, boy, howdy, that shit's going to suck. Very good. Very good. Yeah, this is unusually positive for you, wrapping up a three versus three season. So, yes, yes, I, I do see that it stands out. All right, TJ, how about you? Your final thoughts, wrapping up this season. I didn't even think about what Dagger said, but I li- really like to call out the unknowns of what Mercenary is going to do because of how big that fact It's like Scoundrel or like, Bounty Hunter, right? But now we're, like, doubling down. Um, I think it's a really good call out and what that's going to be in the tournament threes. Um, I'm one of the guys, I, I like Fatal's take on it. I, I like threes more uh, f- just because it gets more theory craftery. I, I don't know if that's a word or not. We'll, we'll take it that way. It was dreadful, uh, but we all knew what you meant. Yeah, yeah and that's where it, it can be pretty you to know that it is in fact not a word. I, oh, shocking. Uh, I, I like it. I, I think going for next threes, um, I still fully expect we'll see Balin and the monster that it will be. And uh, I think that made a pretty good call out of the, that'll probably be the bottom front. And that'll be the new hotness that it goes through. And then we'll get our solution for that problem, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I just hope it's not efficiency. I, I like to see what the data crowns are going to look like. And, and I'd like a non-efficiency based uh, matchup. I think for everybody's sake, that just seems to be a lot more fun when you get a little more slug festery or, or you get into back a, a, a punching game, right? I think it's always been a lot more fun than who can hold the best data, who can do the best thing. So that's, I'm going to keep my hopes positive on that side of things. I think CG does a pretty good job of trying to do things, but unless we get more space, more characters just means more teams. So we'll see. I, I fear, tell me if I'm, if I, if this sounds crazy to you guys, but like, you know, they hear us complain about this problem about too much on attack. And is it, is it a possible design solution that they're entertaining that? So what you're saying is we implement a bespoke data cron that narrows the number of solutions that you can take against a given team down to, yeah. oh, say two. And I don't know, what if we had multiple such? bespoke datacrons in play simultaneously such that you know you you want it to be not efficiency you want it to be one shot well okay fine now you can have multiple teams on the board with bespoke datacrons such that failure on any one of them constitutes an absolute bloodbath i will not put that evil out into the world as you should not task no 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 i'm saying the evil already exists in their hearts it's it's the unspoken yeah exactly it's the unspoken evil of their hearts it's already there we already it, it, rewarded their bad behavior. Like we already like like you realize that like every data cron that they did before Great Mothers was a test to see what how far they could push the envelope. And Great Mothers may be like a hundred and five percent, but I don't think it's much past like Tass said. I don't think I I the more I the more I look at this cron, the more I look at this team, I don't think that CG swung the pendulum too far in the direction that they wanted to swing. Thanks, I think they may have I think they may have overshot with this one slightly but i don't think they overshot with this one by much based on them announcing the bespoke datacron for balin like i i i i'm 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 agreeing with tass here but yeah it's it's one of those things where i don't like manufacturing defense through datacrons but at the same time i prefer you manufacture defense through datacrons than have this efficiency meta personally 
personally. Uh, only part I'm going to call as a counter to that is this was just the setup of a marquee, I guess, high, like round, like second level marquee. Uh, Balin is not a marquee. So well, my, that's why it's going to be overshot by like, a, by like a little bit. I'm, I'm hoping that it's correct and that's, a, that's an overshot, yeah, right? Da- I mean, saying, like, Dagger's saying they put more power into that crown uh, to balance um, that out as opposed to Balin, who will have more power in his kit and perhaps let a well, less I'm just saying, I'm talking crumb. about I'm just talking about the overall layer of what they have for the characters, right? Sure, and sure, sure. he's what a journey character and yeah, the strength level. So the strength level of a journey character with the bespoke. So even if they even if they adjust the nozzle of the strength of the Datacron, my mind lies into the next piece, right? Of uh, okay, there. Here's the here's the nozzle of. We're gonna drop it down a notch, but you're still a journey character, well, and that journey character is supposed to be really close to a GL. Well, to be to be clear, uh, uh, Tash was kind of right, but to be a little clearer on what I meant was, I expect the Balincron level nine to be as powerful as the Great Mother's level nine. Mm-hmm. I'm saying that I think they mm-hmm. overshot where they expected Great Mothers to be by a smidge, because Tash said they narrowed it down to two counters, which is basically correct. I think they wanted the 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 marquees, even if it is a mar a, a, a whatever a, a special marquee. I still think sure. that they in the future, well, we'll know a lot what they actually plan once we see the Balin Cron, obviously. But the more I play with and against Great Mothers, the more I'm like, I don't know how good this team is without this Cron. Whereas the yeah. Balin team without the Cron is going to be really good. I think we all agree with that, right? I think I think that's the one thing is I think we can all agree mm-hmm. that without it, it's like who who called it fatal? I think said it. It's like. Without the Kron, even even with the Kron, but didn't have Morgan, and all of a sudden he's taking a team with it, right? And it's killing it. And it's like it's nothing. And it's combined with the Kron, yeah, it's a GL killer. Without it, it's like, yeah, it's cool. Mm-hmm. Um, but but DTMG is going to crush it. Or Malgus is going to beat the hell out of it, right? Mm-hmm. It's it's not even comparable. Yeah. I think it'll be picked up by its Omicrons. I, I, I know Raj is getting up against the wall here, so... I'm curious to his thoughts on this conversation. Yeah, I was going to pivot to Sasha here next to get his uh, final thoughts, but I guess if you want to, you know, wrap up what they're saying, if you have any thoughts there, Sasha, and then give us your... No, I mean, I, I, I think you guys have hit the nail on the head, and I think there's probably still more calibrating CG's doing with this, but the general overall strategy of OP Datacrons that really put their thumb on the scale for, like, competitive GAC or TW is, is something that they'll keep doing and yeah when it vanishes i think you'll see great mother squad go back to being like the expected strength of like a relatively recent uh marquee based squad right like so uh doesn't surprise me i uh you know when when i was uh thinking about kind of go forward it's this season and then even into the next Datacrons, next time we come back to 3v3, um, and that's the role of, of defense as a stat. And it's it's interesting. I mean, obviously, as we talk about on this show, we tend to face, uh, like, it, you know, it varies, but, like, a lot of times we'll end up against, you know, really bulked up accounts with tons of Datacron rerolls. And um, I really enjoyed the meta where there was – pretty solid defensive viability. I don't think it requires 400% uh, like uh, you know a, a huge pile of 400% defense prawns to do it. Um but I actually don't mind that they've been there. It's, I think it's going to be an interesting shift when the current I guess it's 16 goes away uh and it's 17 and and, and whatever 18 ends up uh, ends up bringing us and that I think it's about as concentrated on defense as a stat, and I think that is playing a role in defensive viability right now. And then it's going to be interesting to see how that flips when we look at, like, 17, you're rolling across eight different stats, whereas 16, it's against six stats. It was much easier to accumulate a high concentration of defense percent. Um, there just were less options to roll against. So I, I'm going to be curious to see if we keep solid defensive viability, if the next Datacron set either doesn't have defense as a stat or they just stick with eight stats across that. And so it's much harder to roll um, because I, I actually, you know, I've kind of a mixed relationship with it. It gets frustrating to, to bang your head against uh, and fail DPS checks against 400% defense crons, but I'd rather have that and have some defensive viability 
than uh, an efficiency meta. So that's kind of where, where my thoughts were about sort of just wondering over the next sort of data cron set where things are going to settle just purely from a stat and its impact on uh, efficiency versus like, you know, uh, mud throwing defense. I, I think you make a very fair point. You know, we'll, we'll all have our times where we gripe about running into something that had an absurd amount of defense and it blocked out an otherwise reliable counter for the rest of the you know current season it was you know still good contemporary within the same week even and it could fail but to your point without defense as a stat historically uh defenses have been a lot less interesting and unless i'm mistaken this is the first time where we've had two sets uh immediately adjacent that both had defense as a stat. So I would expect, if they're going back to a more classic pattern, 18 would have something like armor pen on it, on it to counter. So, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, Dagger said he had to drop. Thank you, Dagger. We'll, we'll catch you soon. But we already got his thoughts, so good deal. But all right. Uh, fair, Sasha. Thank you. Anything else you wanted to throw in? Because I know you're about having a dip, too. Nope, oh, that, that's it. Thank you, guys. Okay, fantastic. All right, Fatal, how about you? Your final thoughts wrapping this up. Uh, yeah, season seems healthy. I'm kind of sad that I wasn't able to be in the mix and fight against the people that I usually fought against because it seemed like it would have been a... I mean, you know, I, I know I'm not, like, privy or exposed to all the less desirable stuff like armor spam that's going on, but I don't know. It, it, it just seemed like a good season, and... It's always a joy to see players like Dagger go through the process that I did of, yeah, man, I, I don't like 3v3 either, but that's the thing. It, it just works. <laughs> it does the thing that you need it to do to be an enjoyable experience. And that's, that's how they get you. That's the dark secret. I still don't like 3v3 conceptually. Mm. But it's just the the more balanced feeling mood right now that lets you it rewards you for putting effort in. Fair. I, I've I have always liked three versus three. Um, first, you know, I, I'm not I'm not ashamed to say from a purely results based perspective, like you, I tend to do better in threes than fives. It's you know obviously there's less engagement with threes than fives, so players like me that generally like it are you know should do better, will be more involved, but. I, I I hope for every person that is generally not liking three versus three to warm to it. It feels like a welcome break from fives. It 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 keeps the game fresh for me. I don't have enough time to get stale on one mode of Grand Arena before I have to go into the next one and I have to change gears. And it definitely feels like a significant way, you know, a different change of how you plan out a board when it's that much larger. Um, I, I wish for everybody to fall in love with threes with, over time. And if and none of those reasons were compelling to any of our viewers, consider this. Every other month, it's the only grand arena in town, so you might as well get to like it because it's here. <laughs> you are here. It is happening. All right. Anything else you got, Fatal? Uh, no. Just kind of trying to get through the next season. Not going to... Worry about whether it's good or bad or whatever. I don't have any expectations for or against. Just kind of, yeah, get through it. Good. Enjoy if there's anything that I don't enjoy. And and I, I know I know me and everyone else at home's also you know just curious how the kitties. Uh we have finally reached equilibrium. That it seems like people are just starting to feel mostly okay again. The the most recently sick cat is. Not a hundred percent, but it's been like a day by day, and they're finally like getting back in the mix. That, yeah, no, it's been good. I, I think the one thing I would say is, I have never previously owned cats that enjoy being carried, mm -hmm. and now I have three that all deeply prefer to enjoy being carried. That it's like, I'm not used to this dynamic. That, I'm, like, I'll I'll hold them for like five or ten minutes, and it's like, no, this is not enough. I'm used to cats that just like want to chill on you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have like, one cat that's a real cuddle bug like that. The other ones, like I'll I'll come to you, you know, once every few hours for a scratch. Yeah, it's like, you know, I understand that. I'm I'm good with that. I've mm -hmm. done that plenty of times. But no, they're not actually all that interested in that. And 
they'll, they'll want to do it, but if you grab them and put them on top of you, they're like, nah, I'm going somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if you pick up and hold them, that's like a 15, 20 minute affair, and you will be, will be the one who taps out first before they do. A commitment, yeah, yeah. Tinsel, you know, when I put want to put her down, she'll hop back up into my lap as soon as she yes. thinks I'm not looking. And then she'll flop across my lap, and then she will either reach out and extend her paw and just gently start dragging her nails across my flesh. <laughs> not enough to draw blood, but enough to be like, how? Uh, or, you know, I get the sandpaper tongue until it's like, okay, fine, I'll pet you. Yeah, no, it's a... Uh... It's a life. I I'm still having to figure something out here because, I mean, at various points, I mean, I I'll carry them around until an arm goes numb or something, or I'll be dual wielding one in each hand, and we're just like, I'll, I'll pro, pro let them tip. look out the window for the 15th time because I can't get, pro tip, get a get a big pouch hoodie. And since, you know, if while they're still oh, small, yeah. this, they will outgrow this solution. It won't last forever. But you can get, if you wear like a like a 2X hoodie, get a 3X hoodie with the big front pouch. And now you've got all three kitties can sack up in there for a time. That is an idea that may help because good God. Uh, I when you said numb arms, I'm like, oh, no, this has to you. This has to go this the, you because that'll be a daily affair. And, you know, what What you'll gain in arm strength, you'll also become muscle-bound. You'll just have your arm locked at 90 degrees for holding the cat. Yep. All right. And just be able to do it for hours, but that's all your arm does now. I'm, I'm already there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Might be time to look into that hoodie. I'm glad to hear everybody's good. Sounds like, you know, cat dad is good. I know you were sick for a little bit, so everybody's healthy. Yeah, we're getting there. All right. I think uh, trying to return to normal, the, the last step of the process is to finally, like tear apart my office to actually get the get it ready for them try to set up a cat cam or some i don't know but yes we yeah, need kitty cam they should they should they should join the stream at some point i think and i like, agree you, uh, mascots are important it's good yeah it's good for channel point generation for happens. the viewers all right uh well before i close out here fatal where can the good folks find you, you know, you're the only other content creator on the channel so make let's make sure we uh, have the folks know where they can see you Twitch.tv slash playbook TV. Okay. And uh yeah, are you know, what's what's a YouTube anytime soon or are you still, you know, brewing in the back room on that? Still got something bubbling in the pot. Uh if it, there was ever going to be any time, I think it's going to be very soon. Good. I Good. the last hurdle in that process. I am on a new machine that has none of my old workflow that I need to learn how to use DaVinci Resolve. If I can do that, I am brimming with ideas and shit I want to say. If I haven't made that clear from me talking way too much on this show at some points. No, no. Yeah. That, I mean, that's, ex that's exactly why we're here. So that's fine. Uh, I'm looking forward to it, though. Yeah, I know, I, I know folks, myself included. Always interested to see if you're going to put something out. All right, man. Uh, well, hey, thanks for everybody tuning into the show here. We're, we're just, we've just made it to the end. It's the end of three versus three. Uh, you know, next week will be the preview episode going into five versus five. I'm still cooking up, you know, who the special guest is. I've, I've had a couple things fall through. Still working on it. We'll, we'll see what happens. But, uh, yeah, stay tuned for that. And, you know, if you want to see me live, I stream on twitch.tv forward slash Tassinix. Of course, this podcast is available on Spotify. I do put the RSS feed link uh, in each video description, so if you are an Apple Podcast user or whatever other podcast platform you prefer, you can plug that link in and listen to it there. But this is uploaded as well to my YouTube channel, Tassinix Gaming. Um, this also gets put out to YouTube podcasts as well. But yeah, also on my YouTube channel, Tassinix Gaming, some other swagger related content that I think you folks would be very interested in. I uh, have the Datacron set review videos currently for sets 16 and 17. I make those with Aesop Rock. One of the number one, you know, usually like number one, number two, number three player in the world. Just one of the very best. Fantastic guy to pick his brain on those. Made mod guides for you guys. Yeah, this started a few months ago. A community request to start covering teams and characters that you guys are interested in. I uh, just wrapped up the Admiral Trench faction last week. Digging into the Great Mother's team this week. But we'll keep that going. Appreciate you guys' interest there. 
And of course, uh, let's see. Yeah, my, my streams. I also upload, uh, you know, my, my VODs from Twitch with chapters added for easy browsing. So that's all here. And by the way, guys, we did just hit 1K subscribers on YouTube. So that's a big mark. And I really appreciate you guys. The, the channel's had a meteoric growth in the last six months. You know, this channel's maybe getting close to four years old. And I would say three years and three months in, it was about 400 or so subscribers. So just here in the last several months, it's gone more than 600 subscribers. And here we are, up over 1,000. So again, thank you all so much. Really appreciate that. And of course, uh, if you enjoy what we're doing here and you want to support me, you want to support the stream, uh, I did create a cash app at you guys' request. That is dollar sign Tassinix. But if you want to get something back, if you want to join my Patreon community and get some benefits, check out patreon.com forward slash Tassinix. For any upwardly mobile Grand Arena player, I firmly believe there is something there of interest for you. $5 a month gets you into the Tass House. You get early access to the Plotting and Scheming podcast. It usually comes out to the public on Friday. My patrons are usually getting it Tuesday night, uh, within hours of us recording, depending on how cooperative YouTube is feeling. You also get early access to the Datacron set reviews, uh, as well as a dedicated text and voice channel on Discord, where you can usually find me lurking if you want to, you know, hang out, pick my brain, just chat, whatever. But thank you so much to Andrew, Arge, Brock Thudsteel, Deadpool Cow 28, JJ's Productions Twitch, Jobin4527, Johnny B. Ottawa, Miasmal, Ray's Malbus, Renee Bay Bay, Sam Vimes, Squed, Stark Strategy Gamer, Sweens14, White Wolf, and Zoltre. Moving up to $10 a month is VIP Access Plus. This is a bundle with Patreon access to me and to OmegaBot. So if you watch my streams, that's the tool I use to get an at-a-glance sense of what my opponent's about offensively and defensively. The patron level tool lets you reach back further than just the last two weeks in time to get a very comprehensive sense of what an opponent's about. And you get a downloadable HTML report with link integrations to swaga.gg, quickly look up counters, what will work, what will drop. Really nice tool. Can't say enough good about it. Thank you to Striker and Dash Satnakam for taking that offer. At $15 a month is VIP Access Premium, and this is the Double Bot bundle. So Patreon access to me to Omegabot, and then to Hot Utils. And that is the number one tool for your mass mod management, uh, making loadouts, swapping your whole roster around with just a couple of clicks. Uh, you know, a couple of players here on the stream, Dagger and TJ both use, not da uh, sorry, Fatal and TJ both use it for uh, automating for Grand Arena. And, you know, I mean, it does all this and more. So thank you so much to Duckstab, Funky, Ibanek, General Milan, Sir Boss, Quig, and Wilco for taking that. And of course, at the top of the list in Jester's Club Elite, the one and only Nomad's Reaper. You know, over the years, uh, he's just come onto the stream and dropped hundreds of subs in one go, thousands of biddies. Uh, an incredible player and a really generous supporter over this time. Thank you so much, man. All right, and then of course, lest I forget, our special thanks... First to Yoda Force, one of my original supporters back in the day, bought me the mic I'm speaking to you on right now. Though he has long since quit the game, we wish him well from the other side. To Mrs. T, my wife, thank you for your diligent work in the background, keeping our industrious and destructive six-year-old from, you know, ruining our home while I am attempting to be halfway decent at a phone game. Really appreciate you. Thank you. And of course, to my co-hosts here on Plotting and Scheming, Dagger, TJ, Sasha, Aisha, and Fatal. Gentlemen, it is a pleasure and a privilege to record this show with you on a weekly basis. Though there can be complications between our busy, you know, work, family, and possible kitten raising schedules, the job is nevertheless getting done. Uh, I think we all learned something from the show, and our viewers are enjoying it. The show keeps growing steadily week over week. You guys are such a huge part of that success. Thank you all so much. All right. Come back over to the main scene to close out. Uh, yeah, looking forward to catching you all in the preview. Uh, this We are currently now in the early days of Conquest for the second run of Set 17. So this is your opportunity to, you know, flesh out uh, your Datacron rosters, shore up any holes that you felt uh, playing with those seven uh, Set 17 crons in this last season. Get yourself ready. This is the last chance. But until next time, it's been real. It's been awesome. It's been real awesome. Take care.